too. Now yeah. that we can actually be seen and heard. Yeah. Oh, How's yes. it going? It's going good. What's happening with you? What are we doing? What is this? What is your, you started a podcast and it's going like gangbusters. It's course. going like gangbusters. People are really digging it. And the gist is visionary thinkers, original thinkers, people with expanded perspectives. And what are our best case scenarios? What are our solutions? How well could it possibly go? And then I love it. specifically, I know you had reached out. Do you know that I wrote a book? It called literally called Best Case Scenario. No, I could. Uh, we could. Really? Are okay. you saying I'm not original? <laughs> <laughs> no, you are. It never. Uh, well, you can ask me about it. <laughs> it never, uh, uh. I wrote it and I finished it the day before 9/11. <laughs> Wow, that's auspicious timing. And then I put it away. <laughs> I did you release like, it? Did you publish it? No, I did not. I did not. <laughs> How many books have you written and not published? Uh, I think just, well, if you count the children's book I wrote in fifth grade. Um, <laughs> I do. Well, then three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a lot because I have the now am I a little hot for you by the way does it seem a little high you sound good sound? okay um you know I did all that whole project when I was in New York as a young artist that was a book project that were one of a kind books that were shown like at the Metropolitan Museum of Art Library and were sort of the launch to my career so none of those books were published but they were exhibited and performed with Okay. Is, does that have the same sort of validation for you as a, as a creator? It did at the time. I mean, but it really moved me towards performance because I was like, I, what can happen with these books? I mean, yes, they're successful. They're being shown, but the best case scenario, I mean, they're books. You're supposed to hold them. You're supposed to read them, you know, and the best case scenario is like a rich person buys them. Like that's the best that could happen. Right. And I, and I was just like, there's, I don't think that's the right career. Like, I just think there's a different thing to do. And so that was what moved me towards performance and making them full size, you know, human scale and then performing in front of them so that, you know, so like that. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Beth, you and I are, are we in it? it. Are we? Are we? Are we're, we we're in it. We're recording. Oh, we're in it already. We're recording. <laughs> we're Hi. Recording. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I was looking up your bio because I'm like, how do I even introduce Beth? In my mind, you're a comedy vanguard and a coach, but I really liked, I think it was the LA Weekly who described you. They had such a great, the alt comedy swami. Yeah. How does that land for you? <laughs> uh, sure. I don't know. People say things about you. I like it. I mean, who doesn't, you know, it's elevated and um, is Swami a word we can even use now? I don't even know. But uh, do you abide by that, by those like the words that we're, we can and cannot use anymore? No. I mean, yeah, it, I, some of it I think is helpful. I mean, I think some of it is mind expanding. Um, you know, to not use the third world, for instance, is a helpful idea because it doesn't um, keeps us from hierarchizing. You know, why why is one world the first word? You know, it's like why order it that way? Some things I think is are diminishing. I think it's case by case. Like some of it is helpful and some of it is diminishing. Some words uh, are are hurtful and better not to use. Some words are silly to limit. I'm really case by case. Okay. Are there certain, it's so funny how we started here. Cause I, I, my aim was to sort of inch us towards comedy and your take on it now with cancel culture. So, but okay. kind of before we go there, I want to set the stage for our audience who might not know what an alt comedy goddess you are. <laughs> okay. I love it. Beth is the creator of Uncabaret, which from my, you know, I'm not a comedian. I'm not in that world. And in the nineties in Los Angeles, it really felt like you were completely changing the game and it, it, it made comedy so fun, so accessible. I mean, I was at Luna park every weekend with all my friends from grad school. Like we were, we were devotees. Um, but can you catch people up to speed on like how you earned this phrase 
alt comedy swami and <laughs> kind of what inspired you to come in and change the game the way that you did sure um i try to tell the short version um uh, you know i was a comedian uh after a pro I, I came to comedy through performance art i had a certain sensibility maybe overly sensitive i don't know but i saw comedy as an art form and i was doing comedy as a woman and there was just so much limitation in what was possible in the comedy clubs it was about tight tens which is you know doing a set that you do over and over and over again a repeatable mechanistic kind of approach to an art um you could say it's a kind of printmaking but it didn't feel like that it felt very routinized and stifling and on top of that the environment for women was very limiting and um there was i was already frustrated with the art part of it and then also there was one night at the comedy store where i was following andrew dice clay which if your listeners don't follow comedy is you know <laughs> i was watching him and he was doing his usual women hating thing and he was killing and i was just hating him and i was hating the audience for laughing at him and i was hating myself for hating them and i don't do well with hate and um and I just thought there's got to be a better way. And that phrase started running through my brain like a ticker, you know, like a, just a scroll, just news scrolling through my brain. Like there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. And, um, you know, if I were me now and that moment happened, I might have been able to get on stage and diffuse it and shift it and change it. And I understand how that works now. I was just frozen at the time. It was just awful. And I didn't know what that way was. But, you know, there comes a point if you have a question, you know, now I say love the question. If you don't have an answer, love the question. I didn't have that languaging then. I just went around with there's got to be a better way. What is it? I don't know. And then I was doing one person show at a, a space called the Women's Building, which was where Judy Chicago did her dinner party. And it was this great art space downtown LA and and the meet and greet I said to the audience it wasn't quite as funny as you thought it was when was the last time you laughed I mean it really you were crazy and they're like oh we don't laugh we're women and we're artists and we're lesbians and if we go to comedy clubs they make fun of us and I said well I'm going on tour when I get home I'm going to make you a show it's going to be unhomophobic unxenophobic unmisogynist it'll be uncabaret and it was a download, Danny. It was just, I don't know where it came from. I didn't have that name. I didn't even know what a cabaret really was. Um, that wasn't my game. I, I and I, and that that's where it started and I did it. And, you know, I talk about it in my book, so you need to decide that, you know, Malcolm Gladwell has this idea about decision-making where, you know, it's the blink moment and, I think there should be a compendium volume, which is called stare, which is all the time you put in before that blink, because where did it come from? It came from nowhere. It was a download. That's all true. But, you know, in the years leading up to it, I had been walking around going, there's got to be a better way. Now here I find my own hunger and the audience's desire and a different kind of experience possible. And I didn't even know what exactly it would be, but I was like, this is a context and this is a place and this is a frame. And as you well know, you know, the frame changes the picture. And, you know, I was like, let's start reframing and experimenting. And that's where it started. And we moved there to high I, and it went well then they lost their funding then we moved to highways where it was just me and taylor negron and judy toll and i think of the women's building as in terms of creativity and how we create things as the really the insemination and, or fertilization and then highways i think of as the gestation really a lot of what it was happened there was shaped there the storytelling the poeticness of it the social consciousness of it, the confessionalism of it, uh, the friendship of it, that it was a show made by friends, that it was um, different every time. All that was put into place at Highways. And then I went off and I campaigned to make First Lady an elected position. When I got back 
Jean-Pierre Boccaro from Luna Park called and said, I'm opening a new club. Do you want to do something here? And on, on I said, yeah, I have this project on Cabaret. And we booked it for three nights and it ran for seven years and now 30. So there you go. <laughs> that's and that's a really short story. But Luna Park is really where most people, what, that's the way you're referring to. Yeah. And that's what most people think of as the beginning. I like to tell the whole story because... I think it's really important for artists to understand how complex the beginning of a project can be. People think, oh, it's just this amazing thing. It just happens full formed. You know, it's that thing about writing drafts and that's true whatever medium you're in. So, um, and there it was really, it was so much about a locus of energy and it was so, you know, only a few times in your life do you get this. Um, right place, right time you know, the group form, people brought in each other. It was extremely organic. Uh, people were still resistant though. I mean, I would tell friends, oh, I'm doing a stand-up show, you should come. I hate comedy, I don't, I don't wanna come see a comedy show. Because stand-up was this thing that was very rigor, rigor mortis -y. I mean, it wasn't like fun for us. And I just kept thinking, well, there's gotta be a show for us. You know, I mean, we have to make our, like our own show, you know, so, and, and, the audience really helped shape it. And I think that's such an important thing too, in terms of like when you're envisioning something and it's experimental or it's new, the, the audience is part of it in a lot of cases. And people started bringing their friends and that really helped us define the thing of like, this is comedy about the now, this is about the now. It's not repeated material. Um, that really was reinforced by the audience. That's a snapshot. I could talk for four hours about it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I want a person asked me when I was doing this, I was telling this story, um, it was the Vulture interview and he asked me, well, when, when that thing happened with Andrew Dice Clay, I mean, didn't you just think like, maybe comedy is not for me? Why didn't you just like go away? Why, what made you fight for it like that? And I really had to laugh because, and I was like, it has never occurred to me in all these years that at that moment I should have walked away instead. Like it would have actually been like, I could have had a whole different life, Danny. I could have not had this fight for my whole life. But I like what you said, like it just dropped in in the moment. Like, yes, yeah. you had been asking the question, but the answer came in in a moment and it wasn't just about you. Like so many people came out of Uncabaret. It put so many people on the map in terms of a bigger audience. And so many yeah. of those people went on to have shows in their own big giant careers. So, so many people, oh my God. And I mean, it wasn't just launching people. I mean, you know, for instance, Kathy Griffin came from Groundlings and, you know, launched her personality based thing there. But also someone like Bob Odenkirk came and he had already been on Saturday Night Live. I mean, it wasn't about necessarily finding, you know, bright new faces. It was a lot about reinvention, not just of the comedy medium, but within comedy people who, you know, Dana Gould, who was killing, already had HBO One Night Stands, but didn't have a big enough palette most places that he worked. And then there were the San Francisco, you know, Patton Oswalt and Margaret Cho and Craig Barron. Um, there was sort of a San Francisco group that came through. I mean, the, the just, you know, it, it was really, it, it still is. I mean, it's really something you just don't know what's going to happen. And we're still, you know, finding, and, and now it's so interesting because it's, one of the, you know, things that happens also now is it's multi-generational and we still have the OG people coming through, but we also have, you know, Hannah Einbinder and, you know, lots of new people also. So it's really super interesting. To me, that's more interesting, fascinating. I love it. I love that, it, that it's continues to stick around. And I feel like one of the zeitgeists that you you know, really tapped into there was just this intimacy of this is experimental. And it felt like we were getting a behind the scenes. People would be, you know, I saw Taylor on stage multiple times, like with notes and trying new stuff out yeah. and like checking in. And it was just like this kind of like the fourth wall came down in a lot of ways. And then we saw that spread out into other realms of Hollywood and entertainment. Yeah. I love that you say that, that I think is so true. And Intimacy is one of the most important defining words for me of on cabaret. Um, and it was why our Zooms, I think, ended up being able to work during the pandemic and continue, we continue them because conversational, you know, conversationalism, actual conversation and intimacy 
are two of the words that are just pillars of on cabaret performing. Yeah. 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 And notes, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, it wasn't a thing before. I mean, sure, bring your notes. Who cares? I mean, this isn't a memorization show. This isn't, you know, who cares? Have a note. You know, write a thing down. Fine. I don't care. Right. Well, and, and like, from my perspective, that was what made it better than a regular comedy show because you didn't know what you were going to get. You could see something, you know, one time only that, you know, they might not carry into another show. It was just a whole different way of doing things. And also at the time like gay was so cool. And you were across the street from the Abbey. You had little yeah. Frida's around the corner. I would come with my gays. Like it was just this really special moment in LA in the nineties. Oh my God. In the nineties. I mean, not to get during the pandemic, you know, we watched at X-Files the whole thing from from beginning to end, which You're was not the only person I know who did that. Really? Oh my God. I love hearing that. I don't know anyone else who did. And it was, so, there was so much of it. It really was like, because it relieved you of decision-making, but it was great. I mean, even if you don't want to do that to just go back and watch the beginning of it, which is the nineties, I'm going to your point. It was a very interesting time because um, we didn't have the time. I mean, we were just on the cusp of the technology. Like we were coming, you know, the internet was starting to happen, but like when but we little. started the show, there wasn't, there wasn't even HBO Sunday nights yet. I mean, there was, it was still the New York Times Sunday paper. I mean, that was still our competition at, you know, then. Uh, and it was a very different, people would share everything because there were no phones. There was nobody recording right. and now people are, there's just no way around it. You just don't share in the same way on stage um, because you don't know who's going to be in the crowd. People are open. People still do stuff, but we, people name names. I mean, yeah. <laughs> people name names and yeah, you people were, and, and we have it all. I mean, it's all been recorded, but I've, I've published a lot of stuff from the archive, but I'm very careful to to not include the material my 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 filter for when i put things out is you know would people do it now right that's yeah. respectable yeah so i'm i'm curious to know i mean i do there are like a couple places that i want to go but let's stay on comedy like you've seen it from the forefront for so long like how is it sh with this tech, with this cancel culture, with these words that we're allegedly not allowed to say anymore? Like, how is that affecting you from the inside? And do you think it's better? Is it helping? Well, it's so confounded and it's such a huge issue. And we're saying this right as this George Carlin thing is coming out. And that was so much about saying the words you can't say. Right. His thing, um, which was that from a different angle. I is mean, there is there a new George Carlin drama that I don't know about? There is something that just came out on HBO Max that's just two episodes that uh, Kelly and Judd, Judd Apatow produced. And, okay. Um, it's like a docu. It's interesting, super interesting. Um, I personally, honestly, feel much of what we can't say, we shouldn't say, and that there's been a lot of abuse of the freedom of speech in com there's a lot about comedy that's making fun of people and i, I mean i know my great friend judy tall uh, judy gold i say judy tall i miss so much um you know wrote this book that is called yes i can say that and she just falls on the line of like we can say anything it's comedy it's funny you have to stop policing us and yes but i also feel like I like her and she doesn't usually say horrible things that I don't, you know, want people to say. There's a lot of comedy that's humil about humiliation and degradation and uh, making fun of. And there's a, a, such a toxic, I find it just so hard to separate the toxic male. I mean, Louis C.K. just won the Grammy, Danny. He just won the Grammy for comedy. It, that the, the comedy world is just like, oh, well, I guess it's bad. We'll just, so I, it's hard for me to separate what we can and can't say. Most of what you really want to say, you can say still. I mean, most of what's interesting, I, I, I haven't, personally, I've never, I haven't needed to worry. Should I say that or not? 
most of the time i don't know i don't want to hurt people maybe i shouldn't say that i don't i don't think it's the worst thing in the world for us to examine our language and think maybe we shouldn't say that thing anymore i i think you know at the beginning of every young cabaret i sing a song called change that mitch kaplan and i wrote called Ch and it's change makes us so unhappy but we've got to change to be happy because we can you know here's the thing here's the thing we cling we cling you know it's all about clinging and evolution and I think a lot of this we should and shouldn't say stuff is, I mean, should, sticks and stones will break our bones, but names will never hurt us. I don't know. It does hurt. I don't, I don't think people should be defamed on stage. I don't, so, I mean, so much of it is like, do you really want Look, I don't want to police it either. I don't want to be the person who's like, Dave Chappelle shouldn't say that, and this one shouldn't say that. I mean, if they want to say it, they should say it. But, do, I mean, and it, I don't think there should be a rule, and I don't think there should be police about it, and I don't think people should be canceled, but I don't know. But just don't want, I mean, really stay away from those comedians. I mean, it's sort of up to the audience, is my feeling. Stay away from the comedians that you find are saying offensive things. And if they have an audience, what are we going to do? I mean, it's that's not the root of the problem. I mean, we've got to go to the root of the problem, which is hate, which is, you know, creating a culture where people don't want to hate each other. And if there's comedy of hate, that's only because there's a culture of hate. So, you know, it's a bigger question than comedy. Comedy simply reflects what's in the culture. Mm -hmm. I don't have a clean answer. I mean, I wish I had a yes or no answer, but those are some of my thoughts. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate it. So a couple things. One, I remember back in the day when Andrew Dice Clay was coming up and was big and I saw his comedy and I thought, wow, I didn't know men thought about women this way. And I didn't like I didn't personally take offense. Mm -hmm. I thought it was like, oh, this is an interesting window mm -hmm. on a realm of perspective that I wasn't aware of good to know, you know, because he had a big audience. He was big and I was pretty sheltered from that. So that was helpful for me in terms of expanding my awareness of the world that I was living in. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting. I take that point. I just, you know, it's hard to follow. If you're, yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think with comedy, it's like, you know, well, then I wouldn't go to his show per se. But, you know, I, I once got into a Twitter thing with someone online who was telling me that because I'm a Jew, that I should be killed and my bloodline should be eradicated. And instead <sighs> of reacting, I was just like, tell me more, like break it cool. Like help me understand your perspective. And because I engaged him from a place of curiosity, he painted it in such a way where I was like, okay, I don't agree, but I understand why someone would think like this. You know, and I just validated, okay, this is someone's perspective. It's not my perspective, you know, but I think there's something to expanding our capacity to hold space for everyone's perspective instead of like micromanaging that everyone needs to have the same perspective. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's a hundred, you're, you're so admirably open-minded. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, and a, that's a, just like, quality of non-defensiveness that is in itself a peaceful quality so you know you emanate peace and openness and curiosity and those are really the qualities that that's the thing it's more about growing those qualities mm -hmm. than reducing what people can say um but you know i i i definitely feel that early on things I wanted to say, people didn't want to hear from me. And I don't know, you know, you never know whether it's just you, but I used to have an abortion joke um, that, I mean, this was just so, I can't believe, I had to post it again recently. I was like, I cannot believe this is relevant again. And I used to say, you know, it's like, uh, I'm not feeling that well tonight. I had to have an abortion. I didn't have to have one. I wasn't pregnant or anything. Just, you know, I had the time, I had the money and I figured, you know, I better get one while they still let us. <laughs> and I would open with that, but now, in, and, and then I, I had an audition at the improv and it just like fell so flat and, you know, is it that I'm not the person people want to hear that from? Is it not an opening joke? Is it, you know, I'm really not a confrontational kind of comedian. So it's sort of like reads wrong, but 
you know, in other rooms with other levels of, I don't know, it's just like, I used to have a, a I had a joke about the challenger um, and, you know, mother nature being like, you, you know, you know, you know, challenge, you know, you know, no, don't send a penis up into the sky and say, and call it the challenger. Mother nature was like, and, you know, I don't know, people, I, people not necessarily want to get, I felt slightly like I'm not supposed to say this stuff. This is like, um, so I, yeah, I, people should be open-minded. That's for sure. I mean, absolutely. I don't, there's no, there's no way to say no to that. Um, most people when their group is attacked or, well, would you say the Jews were attacked in that case? And, you know, did you feel threatened? You didn't feel personally threatened? Like I didn't feel personally, to... he didn't know where I was per se. And I'm, you know, like I, I've gotten increasingly, I'm, I'm not offended by really anything. Um, I, I just think people's perspectives don't necessarily reflect my own perspective about myself. You know, I'm, I'm pretty solid there. And because the Jew thing is such a trope in our culture, and I grew up in LA where we were all Jewish, so it's very foreign to me. Um, I've, I'm just perpetually curious as to why we're the scapegoat. And I'm always just wanting to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, that. Have you learned anything about that? Oh, yeah. I've learned what a lot and I continue to learn a lot. Well, mm -hmm. for, you know, I learn a lot about Hazaria. And, you know, that story that kind of has infiltrated the conspiracy communities or the truth communities. And I think that's... I don't know what that is. Um, I, I don't want to get banned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. Uh, well, off, off. Yes. Yeah, we could, we could talk about it offline. Yeah. And it's yeah. something that because, you know, after, um, because censorship has really amped up, I moved my videos onto BitChute and on BitChute, like every other video I, po video I post, there's a like, shut up kike comment. <laughs> so I'm always just like, wow, where does that come from? You know, I'm wanting to learn, but I do think it's bizarre that on the, the free speech platforms, you know, say like Gab or um, Rockfin, you could talk about anything, but you can't deny the Holocaust. And I'm like, what is that? Why can't someone deny the Holocaust? If they want to, what do I care? What does anyone care? You know, or there was another, I think on Gab, you could talk about anything, but you can't, you know, criticize Israel. And I might be wrong about the platform, but it's like all those things make me curious because if we're not allowed to talk about something, I'm very suspicious. For, from my perspective, that's the only way we're, we're gonna get healthy. And if someone's triggered, and I know you're on your own evolutionary path, and this has informed quite a lot of your work, how do we know where to evolve if we're not, we don't allow ourselves to be triggered and use those triggers as breadcrumbs to see where we still have healing to do? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, I, I mean, you know, Holocaust denials, I'm not, I don't have the same peaceful feeling about that as you, as you the same. I, I guess I'm a little bit like, it's just denial. I mean, uh, to me, Holocaust denial is like the truth of any, any de the denial of any truth. Anyway, that's my, that's my gut on it. Is but just, is, it, is it any different from someone preaching to us about health with a Coke in their hand or a cigarette in their, do you know what I'm saying? Like there's so much denial in our culture. Like, yeah. why is there some sort of overlord that says, well, this denial's okay, but this denial isn't okay. I think there is a slight difference. One is that's uh, a deny. If you're deny, maybe Coke is healthy for that person. I don't know. Maybe it's not Coke. Maybe, uh, and it's that's just them in their bubble, and the denial of a kind of history. I mean, I I actually think the denial of to me one of the most heartbreaking things to me is. <laughs> when I sort of, you know, when, whenever that was decades ago and you go, what ancient wisdom? Why didn't anyone ever tell me about ancient wisdom? They knew so much. And you know, the whole, like how ancient wisdom was just erased from modernism and how it's seen as so kooky to like, think about the pyramids 
uh, and you know, that to me, the denial of ancient wisdom by whether, by what I would call a science culture, um, has been just perpetually baffling and heartbreaking. And I would put that sort of in the same category, uh, you know, to look at history and to sort of go, oh, no, that didn't happen. That That's actually not, hap that didn't happen at all. That's an erasure. And I think erasure has a certain sort of, I'm so interested in every, I'm just every area of memory and um, forgetting and the remembering idea and the re-putting back together and how, and I think that there, that's the healing is there's so much that has been uh, dissociated and disconnected and the remembering is so important. And I think maybe that's why the Holocaust denying would be very upsetting because it exacerbates a kind of non dismembering. Mm -hmm. So any and it's not singular. I think any part of history that's been dismembered and we were going to talk about non and un and the difference yes. between those things. And I would think that dis would be part of it. You know, unremembering the, it, the un implies something that already happened and now is not happening. Mm -hmm. Whereas non is sort of like, it just, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think that may be why it's more upsetting than maybe some, some things. And also just the pictures, you know, the pictures, just, it's visceral. If it, it it's just visceral. I hear that. I hear that. And I, and I respect it and I honor that. I think that's such, that's completely a valid perspective. I am a free speech absolutist and I don't like any labels, but that's a label that I will take on where it's like any individual can do, believe, not believe whatever they want. You know, if you do a search in Wikipedia, you know, or, or on your search browser for Wikipedia pseudoscience and the list that comes up for everything that they're denying in a quote unquote official capacity including the entire Dogon civilization in Africa <laughs> and their body of knowledge, but that's not going to get anyone censored, right? right. That's not going to get anyone thrown out of the public discourse the same way a single individual denying the Holocaust will. And again, when there are these rules tacked on, that's where I get suspicious, you know, like, because I'm with you, like, it's so absurd, who cares? Why give it so much power? Let crazy person X deny whatever they want. But the fact that it's regulated when Jews already come up against so much resistance in this culture, that kind of protection, I don't think does Jews a, a service. I don't think it's helping. I think it raises a lot of eyebrows as far as why is this a protected class, but the mm. Dogons aren't. Interesting, yeah. But well, yeah, <laughs> you're so smart. <laughs> you're so smart. Hey. You have so many interesting opinions. And... <laughs> just I one. Just, I partly, I have to say, I'm just tired of opinions. Part, I, I'm some, some part of me is just, I just want stories and, uh, and, and, and experience. And I, yeah, I am tired of opinions. I, you know, once you've had a few opinions that then are, you decide are wrong. <laughs> and we, we live in such a culture of not being able to change your mind on anything. I, I you know, that the, the, to me, one of the great sins is that like to change your mind, especially for a public person is now your flip flopper. And I'm like, why can't someone change their mind? I, I mean, we learn new things. We experience new things. And we decide something else. And I think it's been such a tragedy that we're not allowed to change our minds. And so I became shy of, uh, and, and once you decide to not go public with opinions and you try to do comedy, it's very interesting. I'm only gonna speak from experience and, um, and idea, which is different than opinion. Right. And so have you gotten pushback from Nobody even notices. Nobody notices. You just decide it, and nobody you nobody has ever said to me, "Why don't you have opinions?" Nobody cares, right, Danny? Nobody's watching. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but within me, I noticed a challenge. I mean, you know, in the day, I would do politically incorrect a lot, and you know, I was right. supporting 
uh, Kevorkian on one. I was hilarious. And I look back at that tape. I'm like, that is funny. But I don't know if I would do it now. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I might, but I don't, I might change my mind. I could flip flop on that one. I think that's awesome. Like, and I think we need more flip flop flopping and more public people flip flopping, flip flopping, if for no other reason than to, to model what it's like to authentically change our minds. Like you're, you're notably curious, you know, for all these years, you know, that we've been in and out of one another's lives, like I'll frequently get messages from you saying, like, help me understand, like break this down for me, you know? So I think that's, that's very unique to you that you are also very open and willing. I agree. And I, I love that about you. And I'm attracted to that about you, your curiosity. I mean, it's, we live in a culture where our curiosity is not rewarded and it is not, it's different than, you know, I think you'll, I think you'll hallelujah this is that like, you know, curiosity is different than uh, clickbait. You know, we are in a sense, our curiosity is being numbed by those minor, I don't even know what we would call it. We should have a word for this. It's not curiosity. It's different. It's like, I want to know, it's like a want rather than a deep well of desire. It's like, a, I want to know that, or I'm sort of interested is different. Something in your face that you're like, yeah, all right, is different than like, oh, I want to know, like, what would we call that? It's different than curiosity. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, um... it's like a minor form of it. It's like an addiction. It's like a sugar addiction rather than a hunger for healthy food somehow. I mean, to really just put it in. Right. Well, I get that in terms of like the clickbait reference. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's just like, and you can, it's almost like if you, if you, if you take the bait enough times, your true curiosity is numbed. You don't feel your true curiosities anymore. And I feel like if I were to say what we suffer from, you know, the, the, the disease of now, I think certain part of that curiosity is missing from, you know, the culture in general. I, I mean, I love your willingness to say, well, what does that mean? Why, why do you deny the Holocaust? And, and just to have an open discussion about it. And that is, that is just not possible in, in an, inf we're inflamed. I mean, we're living in a, if you bring up health, I mean, we live in an inflamed culture and, you know, and, and anger is an inflamed response. I really appreciate you saying that. I think there's a lot to that. Um, Cause I'm just, I'm just thinking of like everything we take in that inflames us and how outraged everyone is. And I feel like curiosity has re been replaced with like, what am I supposed to claim to think about this to be accepted? And that's, you know, that's been indoctrinated upon us. You know, we no longer have objective news outlets. Everything is editorialized. And if you don't ride the party line, you know, so I think, and it's it's fundamentally dehumanizing because people are being indoctrinated to think, well, if these people don't think what my influences are telling me to think, then they're wrong or bad. And so we're not engaging them as though their perspectives are valid, um, which is doing the human family a tremendous disservice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, a hundred percent. I mean, and some of it's not even what we're supposed to think. I mean, some of it's like, what bra should I wear? I mean, you know. Just the bras. Enough. Like, I'm so glad you brought that up because every <laughs> bra these days has this foam that like makes us think that nipples don't exist anymore. And they like put the boobs up on the shelf and there's like a singular kind of breast plane, nippleless <laughs> breast plane that if your breasts aren't there, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> well, I enjoy an underwire myself, but <laughs> I'm impressed. Does it but, feel like torture for you? Or are you a little bit of a masochist? I might be a little. I'm in comedy, honey. I'm in comedy. <laughs> I don't even think I have to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs>